Hey, Scotch lovers, welcome to Thursday Night Live, Scotch for Dummy style. We're going to keep it off theme tonight a little bit and talk about a different topic of Japanese whiskey. What's about Japanese whiskey and what's it have to do with Scotch? Stay tuned. Here on location, a well, warehouse, several locations. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> right. um, Happy Thursday, guys. Sean, obviously, hi, Drew. Good to see you. Cheers. Three doors down. Cheers. Happy Thursday, my friend. Um, I hope you're ready to dive into the topic because it's actually one that I have a lot to learn about. I am yes, definitely not educated on it and ironically enough japanese whiskey is kind of on the rise i mean it's becoming Huge. more and more popular yes it is so it's kind of fun for us to dive into this because it actually really gets its history its start it's what it is today because of what we like yeah because it's scotch i mean it's, <laughs> it's, it's essentially it's the the one um country whiskey other country whiskey that is basically styled after scotch you know, Irish whiskey does their thing. Bourbons do their own thing. You know, French whiskeys, they do whatever they're choosing. But Japanese is intentionally, at least in, initially, right. fine Japanese whiskey intentionally was styled after scotch. That was the intent. So go, well, let's go into a little bit of history of that. So really the the history of, of whiskey in Japan is actually fairly – at least grain whiskey, or you know, like we're talking about the barley, is really fairly young, comparatively speaking. Yes. Now there was distilling in Japan as early as 1870, 1850, whatever. You know, they, people figured out how to distill a long time ago. <laughs> but but as far as actually making a, a intentional whiskey product at commercial scale, that really didn't start until like the 1920s. So you know, you you have Ireland and Scotland all doing stuff in the 1850s, 1870s, 1820s. I mean, way back. Distilleries opening up. Do mention commercial whiskey. Really, that wasn't that popular in Japan. They had other, they had sake, they had other wines, they had other things that they which beer. You said the word wine, sake. I was wrong about yeah. that earlier tonight. Sake is actually technically a rice wine, mm -hmm. not a whiskey. Correct. But there is a rice. There, there is a rice whiskey too. Yes, yeah, so and we'll get into that. Yeah. Later. Um. So initially, so the 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 two fathers of of Japanese whiskey, from what I could find, are one. Um. So butcher this, but. <laughs> Please forgive me. Um, Sinjiro Tori um, was a pharmaceutical like wholesaler in the twenties, and a drug dealer. and did wine, made wines, but wanted to make some whiskey. Okay. So he hired a guy named uh, Masataka Takatsuru, and he was a chemist that studied Scotch whiskey making in Scotland. And so um, Sinjiro, or Shinjiro, um, hired. Um, Masataki to be his head distiller. But Masataki's experience with he was actually doing like internships and apprenticeships in multiple distilleries. Yeah. So this wasn't he was over in Scotland for years. It he, wasn't like a six month, hey, this is what you guys are doing. I'm gonna take this home. He he really he got knew his stuff. It. Right. He really knew his stuff. And so uh so the original um pharmaceutical guy that, that hired him. Founded the company that eventually became Centauri. Now it was they went through multiple things and, and that kind of thing. So, um, but then um, about 13, 15 years later, uh, Masataka decided to go out on his own and found his own uh, distillery company, which eventually became Nika. 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 Eventually. Yeah, and so these two companies are really what are the basis, the core of Japanese whiskey production now, definitely now. Now there's lots of distillers opening up. But those are the two cores. And and those two produce multiple brands or labels of whiskey. Yes, they do. Now, um, so Centauri is actually fairly limited in the, the whiskey they produce. Um, 
at least for the malt market. Right. But Nika is much more open about having um, world whiskeys and other whiskeys associated with their brand. They have lots of other, other whiskeys as well. Yeah. What I found confusing is in, in the world of Japanese whiskey, there's whiskey that I'm used that I would consider whiskey, you know, much closer to scotch and, and your bourbons and your, your dark whiskeys. Mm -hmm. But there is also other whiskeys that I wouldn't even can. I, I mean, they're whiskey by definition, but I yeah. would never consider it. Well, and, and the Japanese whiskey has been really loosey goose for a long time. I mean, they, I, I found a stat today that in 1989, you can consult, call yourself a whiskey. You only needed to be 10% aged malt whiskey. The other 90% can be unaged spirit, generally made from molasses. What the That's hell? Crazy. I mean, it was it was it was a spirit. It was a it was an inexpensive whiskey that was designed to you know drink after you got off work. I mean, that was in '89. That was in '89. So what I read though is back. Get fast forward into the early 2000s, maybe 2005 ish. Um, they actually get some acclaim in one of you know some whiskey oh, competitions, some right, major right. international whiskey competitions, and from there it was. Ooh, they yeah. took off. They took off. Yeah, um, they're, not, they're not a cheap whiskey right now either. I mean, no, and, and no, you're wrong. Right. It's supply and demand. So part of the thing that we need to talk to with whiskey is um, so that they, there's some some cultural differences in the way whiskey makers in Japan work versus whiskey makers in Scotland. Now this is a generalization, so every you know well, there are a lot of small distilleries that would that would vary, but generally in Scotland, distilleries like share barrels. Like hey, yeah, I need some peat in, I need a little bit of uh, sherry, and and so distillers will share barrels and then put them into their own blend, either blended malts or blended scotches to create their blended blended whiskeys. In Japan, it's not as common for Japanese companies to get Japanese whiskey from other Japanese companies. They may pull in, they pull in um, scotch, they pull in Canadian whiskeys, but not within Japanese. So, so that's why the Japanese um, whiskey market is very vertically integrated. They've got the grain um, distilleries, they've got their malt distilleries, they own whiskey in Canada, they own whiskey in America, they own whiskey in Scotland, to be able to add those whiskeys to their lineup to add the flavor to their blended whiskeys. Because again, there are no rules now stating that a Japanese whiskey has to be made in Japan. Now we'll so get to the new rules recently. So time out. So question then. So you mentioned blending. So get, go back to what types of Japanese whiskey are there then? Because obviously in Scotland, you've got different fl flavors, right? With, you get your, your single malt, you get your blended, etc. What's Japanese? What's the deal there? All the same. They've got bl blended whiskeys, they've got blended uh, malt whiskey, or yeah, blended malts, they have single malts. They have all the same types. Grains, other grains. But the difference is, it's not a region requirement. So if you have um, a blended malt whiskey, that means you have malt whiskey from anywhere you want. Not just Japan. Correct. Canada, the United States, yeah, so, Taiwan. Um, there, wow. there's some, there, so the, the statistics that I found from between um, 2013 and 2018, so these are a little bit old, but good enough um canadian imports of with of whiskey or so japan was importing canadian whiskey went up 70 percent imports of scotch scotch whiskey in bulk containers not in bottles went up 750 percent whereas the consumption in japan was flat so, so what, what is the Japanese, Japanese, Japanese whiskey makers were doing is they were buying spirits from around the world blending them with some Japanese whiskey and selling this Japanese whiskey back to the world. Now, what I find interesting about that stat and that, that piece of knowledge is in the research I did, one of the things that I read is said to really compare the difference between a Japanese whiskey today and scotch is that scotch whiskey is really regulated about tradition. They really are, we are going to make scotch whiskey the way we have made scotch whiskey for 200 years and that's it. Whereas Japan is not so much about the tradition, they're about the refinement and ingenuity and, and, and the quality. So they're always pushing the boundaries of making their spirit that much better, whether it means 
new technology or pulling spirit from another location because they don't have quite the restrictions. So it's almost like one, one is about a more of a traditional method and one, the other is more about a ingenuity. Yeah. And so that was the thing that the Japanese whiskey is so interesting about is that they are, they are absolutely master blenders, right? Because they take whiskeys from around the world and blend them to create the concoction that you find in the bottle. Now, so they aren't bound by, well, until April 1st. And we'll get to those. They're not bound by the restriction of um, having to have it all aged in Scotland or aged in Japan, made in Japan, those kind of things. So, so be, just because they buy spirits from around the world doesn't mean it's of low quality. It just means that they, their source is different. And, and, and the problem, I, I saw a comment go through, there's only two types of whiskey, expensive and very expensive. Japanese whiskey. <laughs> it's because it's supply and demand. Um, we can get into the, the growth of this market, which is as, absolutely astronomical, but it's very small. So in 2014, so you were, we, we talked about in like 2000, 2003, they became popular, they started winning awards. Okay. But even in, as far as, as recently as 2013, they only had six million dollars in sales in the U.S. Six million. Six million dollars. Let's just for for comparative, it scotches seven hundred and million pounds. Fifty million pounds. <laughs> yeah. So, and, but the, the problem is, it's growing at thirty percent per year. So then that's it, crazy. So then in two thousand twenty, it's sixty seven million dollars. So so it grew you know, 11 times, 1100% in seven years. So that's why you have such a hard time finding Japanese whiskey is because they're winning awards and you can't find them because well, and, and they're you know, being expensive. <laughs> well, it's they're expensive. It's supply and demand. So the one thing that's interesting, so I've been talking about these whiskey makers are pulling whiskey from all over the world. Not all of them do that. So, you know, they're Centauri, they're Yamazaki and they're Hibiki, um, they're those whiskeys that they provide. They're a single malt whiskey made in Japan, made in Japan, malted in Japan, mashed in Japan, barreled in Japan, aged in Japan, bottled in Japan, and sent to the U.S. But they're really hard to find because, again, expanding capacity at that rate and having an 18-year-old whiskey, 18 years old ago, 18 years ago, right? They had like a million dollars in U.S. sales. So I, we, the only Japanese we have is the single malt. And I don't know. I'm going to butcher that. Miyagaiko. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a Nika. You, you read, it's a Nika. You read the back of the label and literally it says Nika's second distillery built in 1969. I mean, I know that's, you know, for 50, 60 years, but in the grand scheme of whiskey, Megan, that's, it, that's right? a baby. It's a baby. I mean, it's crazy. So we've got a huge growth, which makes it very hard to get Japanese whiskey, which is very expensive. And, um, yeah, so just for an example, um, it, so I gave you the example. 2020, they had 67 million. To, no, um, yeah, 67 million dollars. 2020, it was about it was up 50 percent over 2018. Um, so you're talking like 30, probably 40 million dollars in 2019. Um, Scotch whiskey in 2019, one billion pounds. Man, market. Huh. Big difference there. Big so, it, so while it is incredibly fast growing, it is still very small. And I think, keep in mind, how much does Scotch have of the U.S. whiskey market? Still, well, that's very it's small. Just, it's it's not very it's small. Compared to Seven percent. Yeah. So yeah. the U.S. whiskey market is enormous. In Japan, Japanese whiskeys are very, very small. But there's a, 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 another thing that really separates Japanese Scotch style whiskey. We'll say Japanese whiskey yeah. from Scotch, and that's that's the wood. Uh, Scotch yes. has has certain wood restrictions. Japanese is a little bit more open. Well, up until April first, they can do whatever they want. They can do whatever they want. Um, obviously, they would use they could use European oak and American oak and, and those things. But they're also known for using this Japanese style wood yes. called Mizunara. Yeah, is that what it is? And um, and that's that's a local tree to Japan. That's a, it's, it's essentially a Japanese oak, right? right. 
And so that provides or puts a different flavor profile into the spirit, which made them unique, which I think is kind of cool. That's kind of what we're looking for. When yeah. I, if I go buy a Japanese whiskey, I, I want something that's going to give me the uniqueness of Japanese whiskey. I don't want it to taste like Canadian whiskey. Or, yeah, you know, and, and don't get that. And the, and the age statement single malts that you get from Japan, they're generally, well, they are just like a scotch. They're they're done in the Japanese or in a scotch style with Japanese wood, with Japanese water, and those kind of things. Um, when I was I was able to take a trip to Japan, oh, it was 2008, 2006, something like that. And um, I was able to visit the Yamazaki Distillery, which is the first dis, you know, commercial distillery in, in Japan. Um, it was placed there because of the quality of the water that comes out of the mountains and, and uh -huh. flows through there. You know, it's great. The, it, so it, it, was, it was a beautiful place. They have, they have a whiskey museum where they have thousands of bottles of whiskeys from around the world on the wall that, that their tasters use as a comparison, whatever they're trying to do. Um, I did not find anything other yeast. So yeah, so I didn't mean for you to speak that, about that it right now. I just wanted to point out to make sure because I, I don't know either. Um, so do we want to go into the rules coming up? Maybe not yet. Yeah. I, I'm going to talk a, a little bit more just about the the distillers themselves. Mm -hmm. Drew, are are you there, my friend? Yeah. yeah. All right. So before we get into to the locations and the number of distilleries and what's going on there, what um. What did you find that was different or unique that caught your eye when, when, when we started really trying to talk about Japanese? I mean, it's sad that this is really the only one we have. I've had a couple of bottles. Drew or Andrew brought a couple back. He, he actually had to go to, to Japan for work and brought some back. Yeah. But um, it, there was we, sheep there. We, yeah, we talked about you know Japanese before the show, obviously, and, and you, you brought a couple, a couple things that just kind of caught you as interesting. Well, I mean, the wood was the big thing. Um, just from the research, some of the research I looked at, it's it's very similar to the Scotch, you know, kind of process. But it's mostly, from what I research, is just the subtleness is what they're touting as far as their ingredients. Being able to have more you know, variety and have more subtle notes. I mean, I've only had a few myself, to your point, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with them. Uh, reading some of the comments uh, that are flowing by as well, I'm seeing the same kind of tone as well. It seems to be. Japanese whiskey is very similar to what you would find in a, a nice classic scotch in a sense, taste-wise, but it's more of a subtle note and more flavors, uh, more citrus, more um, um, uh, honeysuckle and di different things like that. So more more minor fancy tastes in a sense, more things that you're going to find more elegant is what I've been researching and reading-wise is that's kind of what they're saying. So I don't, I don't know if that's entirely true because I don't have the, the palate or experience to go through that. But that's one of the things and just kind of how their, their distilleries is almost the same kind of process. And I was going to ask you, Andrew, as well, if you did any research on the distills, because it seems like what I saw, they're very similar in how they do it as well. The local water comes in and they do the same yeah. situation. Um, it's mostly about their, their ingredients. And also the other thing, too, is their climate, right? So it's colder there a lot of times, so it ages slower. That's another so thing. The, the climate, that, that was a question I have that I, I, I don't know the answer to. I'm not setting myself up for an easy answer. But if you pull the map up of Japan and the distilleries, sure. I mean, you know, I don't know the actual land mass of Japan to Scotland, you know, comparison. But I, I know that in Scotland, you, you do have some climate differences from Highland Park down to Springbank, yeah. right? Or, and especially if you move across the aisle over to into Ireland, when you have that Gulf Stream, that changes things too. But in, in, in terms of Japan, you know, is there a major difference in temperature between the northern and the southern distilleries? I would think not. It's not that big of an island, but there could be. I don't there, know. There, well, so... Japanese whiskey do, in general, tend to age a little more quickly than like a scotch because uh -huh. it is a little bit more temperate. But um, I know one of the one of the original uh, masters of uh, Japanese whiskey did come through, and he the, he was trying to get. I think I was on the North Island where where Akeshi is. Um, that climate there is very close to Scotland, and so he was trying to build a facility there, but. They built the Yamazaki distillery, which is much farther south, which is more temperate, which is which is a little bit warmer. And so a three-year-old whiskey 
in, from Yamazaki has more barrel influence than maybe something up at, at the Akeshi um, distillery. So, you know, so what, what you're looking at here is a list of all the open and, and recently closed, uh, well, recently closed distilleries in Japan. So you took looking at like 13 different distilleries. You know, there's more, there's almost that many on Isla. I mean, well, it's twice as many as on Isla. So again, because of the volume, um, it's it's a much smaller market. Now, the one thing that we're not talking about here is the Japanese domestic market for whiskey, which is really the core of their business, the, the bulk of their business. And they have, you know, the, the rules that you see about Scotch whiskey are much more lax. They have a lot more flexibility with those. Um, a lot of the world whiskeys, what they call the, ten, the that's where the 10% of Scott H. Scott whiskey or age malt whiskey was a requirement in 1989. But they also, they, they're they very clear that this is a whiskey blended from Canadian American right. scotch. So at least they're Japanese. transparent. Yeah, they're, they're fairly transparent about it. And again, you, you're not, these may not, these are whiskeys that are more commonly used in highballs, which is a huge thing in Japan is, is the highball. Using a whiskey, using a Japanese whiskey, mixing with a soda of some kind, and you make a highball. And you, you can see it in um, a lot of the stores. It's Quite honestly, it almost reminds me of like, well, what, like you can get the uh, the Jack and Cokes in, in a can. You can get uh, uh, Michael really? Lemonade in a bottle. Those kinds of things where it's it's essentially using Japanese whiskey and soda to create a good drink. Now, apparently, if you go to a, a, a fine whiskey bar in Japan, that's where you want to have the highball. Because of those highballs are handmade like and you would get yeah. in a handmade whiskey bar in the U.S. Well, I, from my experience with Japanese whiskeys, and that, that it's limited, I've had uh, my, less than a handful, um, and that might be one or two more than you've had, Drew. To be honest mm -hmm. with you, I don't know. You're, we never talk about them. I mean, we're Scotch heads, but yeah. I, I can say this much: the limited drams I've had have all been enjoyable, so even nice. when they're the lower end version of what you would you know, consider a Japanese whiskey. I'm, I'm very interested in it because I have yet to really get into one that I've just been like, oh, can't do that. No, no. But things changed, right? So it literally within the last two or three months, you're saying, right? And this, there's some new things that have changed in the wide world of Japanese whiskey. Yes. That's that I'm very curious to see what it does to, to the process, to the whole industry. But you're saying they actually, threw down some new rules. It is. Now, they're not law, but they are governed by the Japanese Spirits and Liquor Makers Association. Okay. Just like the SWA. SWA. That, that starting April 1st, any new bottlings of Japanese whiskey must follow certain rules that are very close to, to Scotch whiskey rules. Um, a couple of them. Number one, malted grains and other cereal, other cereal grains. So you have to use a malted grain. It doesn't need to have to be all malted grain. But it has to be some It needs to be some malted grain. It doesn't say it needs to be malted barley, but it's got to be malted grain. Um, uh, it has to be mashed, fermented, distilled, matured, and bottled in Japan. Oh, so that's you, huge. You, you could no longer import Canadian whiskey and call it a Japanese whiskey. So, that, so that's a big deal. Um, now, they are going to allow bottles that are currently on the shelf to maintain on the shelves through okay. 2024. So, you know, like grandfather those through, but any new body except April 1st. Um, three years in a wood cask, less than 700 liters, just like Irish, just like Scotch. Um, minimum 40% ABV, just like. So um, that didn't exist prior? No, there were Japanese, so especially in the, in the, in the Nika. The ABV? Yeah, Nika had um, some, for the domestic Japanese market, had some like 31%. Whiskeys. No shit. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just it's what the market wants. So, right. Um, um, now, if you don't follow these rules, so malted grains, mashed, all done in Japan, three years wood cask, minimum 40% ABV, you cannot use the names of geography, geographical locations, the Japanese flag, or names that evoke the country on your bottle. So you can't even call it Yamazaki um, blend. If it's not, if it doesn't follow all these rules, because wow. of the Yamazaki name, you know, oh. it, you cannot be at all associated with Japanese whiskey, which I think is pretty harsh. It I is mean, pretty harsh, but it, I mean, that really. I think it's messed up. 
yeah, if you want to use the moniker, if you want to be associated with it, follow our rules. Because how else are they going to punish you otherwise? How can they steer you in? Well, you know, so I, I thought that maybe you could do like it's a Japanese base world whiskey or something. You know, you maybe you can use that term, but it's real interesting. What do we got? Uh oh, that's funny. It's, yeah, 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 I do remember that. That's, funny. <laughs> That's awesome. I think he's a nice, nice man. I love it. So, uh, so the other thing we, we, we're talking about here is um, Suntory and Nika, they agreed with this. They're good with this. Of course they did. Um, they're huge. Well, and Suntory says that all of their Yamazaki, their Hibiki, um, there's another um, Hakashu, those brands are all follow these rules anyway. So that begs the question. How influential were they in creating these rules? Well, <laughs> let's go the back to the map. <laughs> okay. well, Who's going to be dark and white most, now? <laughs> most of those are very small distilleries, and some of them aren't really distilleries. They're they're a buyer, blender, packager, and so they should, uh, that's what they were doing. Um, I don't know if we got the Agio coming. Yeah, so, but but Nika does have a lot of brands that don't meet these rules. And they're okay with that because it's mostly domestic market. They're not selling them as Japanese whiskey. You know, it's okay. We're, we're upfront about that. So, um, and the other thing that, that was really interesting about this is the um, when they put out these rules, it wasn't. They were very clear about not saying that all the hey. other whiskeys are bad. All the other previously Japanese whiskeys are bad. They were talking about the rules of Japanese whiskey at the time were loose, and so people were creative. And right. so you were able to find a way to provide whiskey that tasted right. good and served the market. And that's fine. That was perfectly all right. But now we had different rules. So let's talk about that for a second. So real quickly. So Scotch has been around for how many years? A long time. And let's just well, say 1824 for when kids. did the official Scotch whiskey rules come in though? Oh yeah. When did the SWA rules that come I in? Have. I don't know. Good question. So it seems like now Japanese, not not so much as far as a long time, right? They've been around for a little while, but not not, not nearly as long as Scotch. It babies, seems yeah. like it seems like, then not knocking because I don't know enough about it. But it seems like, hey, we're starting to become a thing. Let's let's get this stuff tightened up, ship here. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's market this. Let's put more regulations on this so we can have better, you know, quality and standards. Our price is already going pretty good. We're seeing a good growth. Like you mentioned earlier, that's a pretty damn good growth. However, they're not even close to Scotch yet. And Scotch is not in America speaking, you know, they're not even top, top in the door to knock on the door to bourbon yet. So yeah. it's interesting to see what are these rules? I mean, how are they going to change supply demand and, and advertising for that? I Here's one thing that I can say, though. So Japanese are known for their innovative and, and, and trying refinement of the spirit. Of, of, okay. These rules don't hamper that. They can still get creative. It doesn't say Correct. what kind of wood, um, where Scotch still has some much more strict rules That's because correct. the Scotch rules are more about maintaining tradition. Is that true? Okay. Um, wow. 1942. So that's not like a, there wasn't something going on in the world in 1942 that they had to come up with <laughs> rules for whiskey. <laughs> well, the problem was in the in Prohibition era that you would get Scotch whiskey in the U.S. and they would take neutral grain spirit and put creosote in it and call it Scotch whiskey. Oh, okay. That was the problem. <laughs> well, so you need, you need rules and regulations. I get it. I, it's in, but my point is, I'm happy for them because it seems like that's the right approach. To having consistency and quality, I, I I know I don't know enough about the industry to say it's a good thing. I guess, but it feels like it's a good thing. You know, the kind well, of I think it is. I think it is too. And then the reason I say that is, is a lot of the articles I read today were talking about, you know, Japanese whiskey um, wholesalers would come to the U.S. and see these bottles on the shelf marked Japanese whiskey that they'd never heard of in Japan. That these these were these were companies right. that were putting garbage in a bottle. And, and disparaging and, and calling it Japanese whiskey and charging a premium for it. Right. And or if you look at, I mean, just walk into your average liquor store, I mean, and look in the shelves. I mean, I, I do see Japanese whiskeys, but not very many 
I see scotch, not that many, but boy, are there's plenty of room for bourbon and then there's plenty of room for rum and tequila and, and things like that. So, I mean, it's going to take a while to, to grow that shelf space. It will. It will take time. They, they don't, they just don't have the capacity right now. So if you're putting down a Yamazaki 12, right. 12 years ago, the market was 5% of what it is now. Right. You just don't have the, it just takes a while to build the inventory. Now they're building up, but, but well, last year I heard, um, last year I heard, you know, because brown liquor is hot. It's still actually still pretty damn hot. Bourbon is still through the roof. I mean, I think I we're starting to get into the bourbons now. We're getting ready to, I should say. And I know that um, in talking to our fir- uh, friends, bourbon friends, you know, the, the bourbon bottles themselves have just skyrocketed in price from demand, right, recently. Obviously, with COVID, it's helped with that. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with, Japanese whiskey is it going to take off? Because I mean, I, last year you heard rum's going to be the next thing. Rum's going to be the next <laughs> thing. Rum but, down, down. I don't yeah. know. You know, Tom who knows? It'd know. be interesting to see if if we continue down that path or not. And I mean, there's lots of room, lots of room. Sad but true. Soon to be over and a new normal. I think our collective love for good whiskey and the S4D helped up all. Yeah, Tom, we appreciate that, my friend. Cheers, brother. I love um, you, Tom. Thank you know you, what? Bro. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on that and, and use your super chat to um, also throw out a, a happy birthday to a dummy. Drooby dooby doo. Drooby doo. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> luckily, 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 I'm out. So he's gonna pour himself a glass. on me. So I guess I'll have a glass. <laughs> Welcome to the 14th anniversary of your 35th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But one Thank comment you. I want to make in regards to the growth or the effect that you were talking about, Drew, is just like scotch, any in whiskey industry that has age requirements and stuff, it's it's always a slow progress, right? Yep. You never see these massive spikes in the industry because you can't plan that way when you have to age for a long time. Yep. It's just hard. So hopefully we see it you know in the near future but what's that mean in the wide world of aging spirits yeah i don't know yeah uh-oh what's that? everybody's wanting to get in on drew's birthday Ed, he's the old man he's the oldest right? he's the oldest dummy they want me to open my Beanston 20 up there. I, I, have, I don't have a bottle open. I guess I'm going to have to open one later. I don't oh know. My God. Oh, I don't have a bottle open, he says. I'll be down. I'll be down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, you won't because you don't like Beanston 20s. You're much. right. I'm not going to drink a Beanston 20. I would do that. I, I would say the same. He's like, you can't taste it. So, <laughs> <laughs> no. so getting back on topic, I actually yep. am looking forward, just like I am to bourbon this year. I think I think the dummies, you know, um, are in line to try more things. And and Japanese whiskey is definitely intriguing. It's going to be harder on the pocketbook, but I think it's going to be intriguing, especially if we can find some. So we, we may be in a hunt for a few decent bottles. I, I agree with you. I'm excited about all of it, not just Japanese or Irish or God forbid, even bourbon and the rise, <laughs> uh, because I think all it does is it expands our appreciation for scotch and our appreciation for whiskey in general, our knowledge, our experience. I mean, it's it's all a good it's part of the journey. Right. I think we're finally at a point where we can expand mm-hmm. our wings a little bit on our journey. And um, it's it, I, I'm excited about this. You're right. It's probably going to cost us in the pocketbook, but we'll see where we get with some Japanese. But yeah. You know, we don't have to dive in head first like we did scotch. <laughs> Thank you, KB. KB. Wow, KB. Good up. Lord. Right, I would have thought you would have left that at 49. <laughs> Here's some pretty good. That's nice. Thanks, KB. Yeah. <laughs> so so there's one other whiskey that's popular in Japan that you know a little bit about. I do. Talk so, to showed me. you? Soju. Oh, Soju. So yeah, well, he was telling me about the experience. He said Soju. And, uh, and I was like, wow, why do I know that name? Um, and, and everybody in the military that I know when I was in the Air Force, you know, you get stationed over in, in Korea. That's the big drink. Everybody's like, oh, man, we're going to get some Soju, right? And um, it's unregulated in Korea. So you can get a dram and it'll damn near kill you, knock you out, give you alcohol poisoning, or you can drink a two liter of it the next day and not get a buzz. So it's unregulated, but obviously in Japan, it, it probably is regulated well, and it's more appreciated. Yeah, so now the, the thing about that is the rice whiskey 
called sho shochu or however you call it. Um, it doesn't use the malting process to create the sugars. So the rice whiskey is not legally Japanese whiskey. And so what's so they use they use a mold. Um, I think it's called koji that breaks down the the sugars in the rice or the starch. Oh, that sounds rice. delicious. And and it, that's what <laughs> creates the fermentation capabilities for the rice the rice whiskey. Um, so they're actually not going to be able to call it rice whiskey anymore. They're just going to call it that shoju, and um, it's a, it's a different. It's like bourbons and brandies and things like that. It's just a different class of. With of spirit, I guess. Maybe we still clear that for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the regulations are. Is he that opening way. that bottle of 20? Yeah, look at that. He's pulled out the seal. Hang on a second. Moment of silence. Yeah, we need a moment. A drum roll. So Michael Porter made a good point. He's like, open that bottle slowly with that cork. These decent 20s yes. have the Amen. worst cork in the industry. I don't know what happened, but they always break. So... All right, guys, thanks for the birthday wishes. I haven't opened a bottle in a while. I guess it's good times, any. So let me go ahead and open this real quickly. How about some burnt toast for you, buddy? Oh, it's open. Oh. That's a good point by Michael, though, man. That guy's a genius. Uh, I know he's going to start. He's gonna start his own YouTube channel and pass us all. Yep. All right, guys, cheers. Thank you so much for the uh, super chats and birthday wishes. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Cheers. Guys. Cheers, my friend. Um, so we were talking about the rules of Japanese and that's actually news it's new right it's I mean when when did you say as of April 1st so literally like in two weeks yeah are we right new Japanese whiskey bottles will all have to follow that that's wild okay so let's let's take that and let's transition it into new scotch in the news because there's some interesting things going on right I mean obviously everybody knows the tariffs have been uh, we'll see uh, amen now, light a candle <laughs> Various chicken in the backyard. <laughs> the, the tariffs have been lifted, but the prices haven't gone down. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully they will. And they will. They will. They will. They will. I actually have already been emailing with one of my um, favorite online uh, whiskey stores over the pond that literally responded and said, you know, things are, are, are finally getting back and, and the tariffs are gone. We can get back to, to, you know, That's life awesome. as we know it. So hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll save. But um, there's a couple of interesting things in scotch in the news that I found. And it's not like I dug deep, right? But <laughs> how, I don't know how involved everybody is and in, in even looking on what's going on in the world of scotch in the news. And one of the things that I honestly just find astonishing is that there's a new distillery that's being opened a, another you know, another new distillery and i don't i'm not surprised by that okay no problem i get it there why wouldn't you if you got the capital sean wants to it he's been honest for years yeah. you know let's go buy some old mothball distillery right um but this one is literally like in the heart of space side and that one to me i mean if i'm going to open a new distillery in scotland Am I going to go where there's already 75 to steal? Well, it's easy to get in place. The land's cheap. The land's cheap up there. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so it's um, it's called uh, it, a new Dunfail Scotch Whiskey Distillery. It's just south of, what is it, Forbes? Is that what it's called? Uh, Dunfail, just just south of Forbes. But interestingly enough about this, they, they plan to start distilling spirit in 2022 which it means that's a quick construction. Yeah. Um, but they're going to do it all. 100% um, um, have a house floor for, for malting and kiln, and they're going to do all their own barley, right? They're not, they're not going to outsource that at all. It's all going to be in-house. They're going to produce peated and unpeated styles uh, of whiskey. Um, they're going to have their typical visitor center and whatnot. But to me, I love the idea. I hope they're successful. I'm excited about what they're going to do, even though we're not going to see anything for a long time for them. I mean, obviously 2025, maybe. At, at the earliest, earliest yeah. Um, at the earliest. But you think about what they want to do and then the how much they can output. We're never going to see any of that stuff here. We're going to have to go there to get it. I mean, oh, oh. Sounds like a trip. Wow. That's a good idea. You know what? Maybe they're hiring. I, I I would love to be a visitor center person and walk people through that place. But I I mean, 
it's not the only new distillery that's coming. Obviously, there's some big ones, right? The, your Rose Bank is getting ready to open back up and stuff like that. But this I thought was cool and interesting because it's literally like in the heart of Speyside, which competition galore. Um, and the fact that they're going to do all of their own malting and, and floor, you know, drying and uh, take care of it basically from beginning to end. Now, that doesn't mean they're growing their own grain, no. but um, it. I don't know how many distillers out there are doing at least all of that, a hundred percent of their barley. Yeah, that annoying. Some are doing some. Yeah. Um, the, so that actually is maybe not a bad idea to open there, because you know there there is some assistant master distiller that's been behind the old guy for thirty years, and the old guy won't die. And I can move over to this place and be the be the chief. Because yeah. I mean, admittedly, there there aren't a whole lot whole lot of jobs in whiskey because it just you don't need that many people to make whiskey, and That's so when true. you when you get a you know you, you see these people in the in the still houses that are been in there for thirty years, just because it's a good job, it's consistent, it's stable, and they do their job and don't need don't need to re rehire, so there it's hard to move up in that. So another distillery opening, I can move over. And become master distiller, master blender. So, so hey, it's interesting to see what they they do with their peat. Like, where are they going to get their peat from? If they're going to be peated whiskey. They're so. going to peat it themselves. But is it a Highland peat? It's an Highland peat. Yeah, oh, really? I see yeah. what you're saying. Damn, you're right. I mean, and maybe that's one of those twists that they can do. This year, it's a Northern oh, Highland peat. That would be Next year, it's an Isla peat. That would be really cool, uh, Andrew, if you could figure out a show where, you know, like where the different Scotch whiskeys with different peat sources and compare them. That would be kind of a neat, neat combination. It'd be hard where to do. Where is from? Right. Where is it, from? it might be tough to find out, you know, if they, they disclose that. But I love that idea because, to be honest with you, there is a difference. Yeah. There is a dress. Hey, hey, you're tasting like. Stuff's been around for a long time, different areas of the earth. I mean, it's in, in their right. Well, it's different plants. plants. I mean, plants exactly. Different. exactly. Different plants it's make dirt. different people. <laughs> so I, I found cool. a, a, an article and I got to talk about it because I love looking at these kinds of lists, right? The best of type <laughs> list, right? So the best bottles of Scotch whiskey between $125 and $150. Thank you. What was that for? Oh, I, Michael was uh, cheering me with Decent 20, so I was... Oh, all right. I'm cheering you. I, I, anyway, best boss, bottles of that's, scotch. That's a narrow range. Between $125 and $150. It's a narrow range, and not only is it a narrow range, but it's $125 to $150 in your market, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, let's be honest. That's March, late March of 2021. Right, so yeah. let's let's look down and see what the best top 10... If, if, Oh, it just says the best stuff. It's not even top 10. So, Glen Ranji, A Tale of Cake. That's pretty sweet. That's good. Um, I Okay. I'm not going to disagree with that. They're saying price point 125. Aberfeldy 18. Now, I got to look to comments on this, guys. I don't I don't have any experience with Aberfeldy. No, or the experience I do is so limited that, Yeah. I, I mean, I want to agree with it because it's an 18-year-old at 43%. At, but is anybody out there had an Aberfeld or 18 and would they consider it one of the best in that, in that price range? In that price range? I, I don't know if I would. I don't, yeah. I mean, in my experience and, and what, so what where are you getting this so people can follow along? Oh, it's, it's, it? up, you know, it's, um, up rocks it, type, com. type, type it in the U P R O X X dot com. Like, you know, shoot, hang on. I can, I can put it in the comments right here. I got you, buddy. Um, if I can find the comments of this video. <laughs> Tom Hart doesn't like Amber Feldman. Tom Hart says no. There you go. So here's the the, the, the short list, if you will. Um, it's just uh, Glen Raji, Aberfeldy. Let's get on to the next one. Jura 18. Yep. You know what? I don't have that much experience okay. <laughs> with Jura 18, but but – I've had some jurors I've liked, and I've had some jurors that missed the mark. Well, but this What's is the, the new topic of the article again. What's the title? Title is, and someone said clickbait. 
best bottles of scotch whiskey between 125 and 150 dollars <laughs> and you know this if you're like, scotch this is ridiculous like i mean <laughs> So I mean, it is there aren't that many bottles between 125 and 150 dollars. It is kind of a, a narrow range for a Scotch horror. Of course, I'm going to click that link and be like, "Well, oh, yeah, no wonder we're going through it tonight." <laughs> oh, right? I mean, but anyway, it, it's fun because so, there's a couple that I, I, I I'm like Mortlock 16, the Distiller's Dram. What the what? I where the hell did you get that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, okay. This is John uh, Smith's bar down in his basement. He's going, hey, I'm going to go through my top 50. <laughs> I mean, uh oh. Uh -oh. We're uh, we in full force. The other dummy has showed up. Woohoo! Let's see what he thinks about this list. So I can finish this. So let's go. So let me finish the short list, you guys, because I'm interested in this. So Olan Distillers, the Dennis, uh, Distillers Edition. I can agree with that. Um, Deanston 18, I think Drew agrees there That's for that price point. And we're going to call a TV timeout to say, hold on now. Get on, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're we doing right. Japanese tonight, my friend. Okay. So, how, how do we end up here? here? You're going to finish the last of the <laughs> Japanese whiskey. That's all yeah. the Japanese we got. We saved it for you. Where part did that come from? Yours. Yours. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> all right. I'm not going to slide that way. Mm -hmm. Just touch the squares up. I'm coming over, guys. I'm coming over. So let's finish this quick list because I got one other article I want to talk about. Um, Lafroy Glor. I don't necessarily know if that's – well, it says 145 bucks. I think that's what it's going to go for. I, I, I like that bottle a lot. That's good. Um, but there was one. Highland Park 18 comes in at $145. I'd agree with that. Glenn Livet Enigma. Where's Drew? <laughs> Drew, put your face up. Come on, Drew. Drew, Come you on. like the Enigma, don't you? Well, like Drew, are you going to say that Enigma is one of your best whiskeys between $125 and $149? <laughs> this list is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, this is the worst so, list I've ever seen. Well, let me go to the, the last one down at the bottom. And maybe it's not the last, but yeah, it is. Aaron 18, and I'm going to look at one subscriber when I say this because I don't have the experience with Aaron, but I do believe Everwind is an Aaron fan, and I'm very curious to see if he's had Aaron 18. And it, it says it comes in at 150 bucks. Um, and if he has, if you have, Chris, is it is it in that list for you? I don't know. I, I don't have the experience with Aaron. I that one I'm not sure about. I don't know that I don't know it enough to say. Who, but who made this list? Some uh, clickbait up rocks that someone already called me out. They're like, "This is clickbait." I'm like, "I'm a Scotch whore, of course." I'm gonna Steve, <laughs> Steven Rogers likes it. I, I just think it's interesting how, like, see, there you go. There, there are some of these articles that that do come in with with a degree of knowledge that you're like, "Oh, well, this this person actually knows what they're talking about." Right. I may not agree with all of the picks, but so I understand so where they're coming from. from. And then there's some things that are like, "Well, you like it, maybe not." Maybe not. Oh, well, yeah. People are liking that. So, Aaron 18 belongs. We haven't done much errands. We need to get back into those. I think we really do. And you know what's funny is everyone just called us out on it a couple times. Yeah, I know. He like, has. Point yeah. us in that direction. So, the last thing I wanted to point out, I found this, that, that this is an awesome piece of information. The top 10 Scotch whiskey markets by value in 2020. So, these are countries that are importing Scotch or scotch is exporting to them. And make sure you talk about um, how they change between 19 and 20. Okay, so Australia comes in number 10. Number 10, Val well, I, they don't have actually have them, it doesn't say 10, but I'm assuming that. Um, it export Australia imports 113 million pounds a year of scotch, 113 million pounds down three percent. Okay, that's that's a lot of money. But in the grand scheme of imports, exports, George Costanza, it's not much. Um, China, 107 million. I, I wouldn't have expected China to be importing that much in scotch, but up 20%. Is it all scotch blue? <laughs> Is it that market? I don't know. Who knows about scotch blue? Uh, I do. Japan imports 114 million pounds of scotch. I thought it would be higher. I really did, considering Scotch kind of birthed Japanese whiskey. Yeah, that's yeah, that's down twenty-two percent. 
Well, and especially since it's kind of hard to get Japanese whiskeys now, too. Like it is, yeah. They've got supply issues also. So yeah. yeah. We talked all about that before we got here. Yeah. yeah. I'm so you, you, have to, you have to listen to the podcast. Spain. Sure. <laughs> Spain imports $109 million worth of scotch, which I didn't, I wouldn't have ever thought of Spain, down 40%. Uh, wow. I they, know. Of course, they locked down hard. So I got started on. My scotch journey, actual scotch journey, uh, there was a guy that I went to culinary school with from Madrid. From Spain. And, and he was, yeah, and he was a feisty little dude, and he drank Glenfiddich, and that's what we had before school every day. <laughs> and he got before school. school. <laughs> yeah. So coming in at Four six years. is Germany. That's not a surprise mm -hmm. to me. Actually, I might have thought they would be a little bit higher. They're 100, quite a bit. 139 million pound, down 25%. That's a lot. And they're actually, I mean, think of the folks that we know from Germany that I'm, is, is some of that like great drop in EU. Is it a it's COVID Brexit thing? thing? No, it's, it's, a COVID, COVID it's a COVID thing. thing. People weren't out. People were locked down. Yeah. Cause Americans like to drink when we're locked up. Yeah. Which you get to, to the U S I'm very excited. So it says <laughs> Germany <laughs> suffered from the closure of its hospitality trade. Yeah. Which is COVID. fair enough. Fair enough. Number five, who in the hell would have guessed Latvia? Really? Like like their scotch, man. See, that blows me away. Uh, it's, it's not per capita. It's total value. Right. Like, Latvia is number five. They're like this big. Yeah. Like, that big. I mean, really? I mean, just 176 million up 23, uh, 176 million pound up 23%. Wow. Latvia? Hey, man, power to you, brother. Hey, yeah. Hey, I enjoy my up scotch, 23%. Too. Good That's for crazy. you. Just don't take the good stuff. Four is Taiwan. I agree that. 182 yeah. million down 11 percent. Then Singapore again. Fair. Not surprised. Huge population, 247 million. That's a big jump from 182. Yeah. Though. yeah. And then we get into the top two. France. Not surprised. Wait, on, let me guess. Number one. Is number okay. One. Listen to the numbers, Drew. Canada. France is number two with 375 million pounds. Not bad. Down 13%, but still 375 million. <laughs> Leave it to the good old red, white, and blue to come in. Hey, hi, oh, oh, oh. New Jersey and New York. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mostly, uh, mostly very, New York. Very close. 729 million pounds. I mean, it's more Go than on. double uh, of, of France, and it's down 32%. It was over a billion pounds in 2019. That's wow. insane. You know, I want to know how much I'm a part of that number. <laughs> so here's, so here's an interesting thing I learned from my wife a couple of days ago. So I don't drink a whole lot of soda, but every once in a while I'll grab a Sprite. And I don't know if you've watched the grocery stores, but since COVID, like Sprite, lemonade cans, my kids drink lemonade cans. Like certain cans of drinks, you can't find them anymore. They're gone, right? And wow. for the longest time, we thought there was sugar, this, you know, kind of deficiency or whatnot. No, no, no. The issue is, I found out, it's kind of a sad fact, to your point of how gluttonous America is on a shit like this. Um, it's because aluminum is hard to find and demand, and they figured out that beer is more important than soft drinks and everything else. So aluminum shortage and supply is going towards beer cans. <laughs> I mean... I mean Fair. We we don't have a drink period in America. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> it, I just thought it was interesting to see the numbers. I mean, I, I definitely when you look at global numbers about where Scotch is going and, and how much it is, I, I find it interesting. And now, there was a couple things that surprised me: Latvia, the, I mean, the difference between one and two. I mean, it's not even close, but. It was it, it was a fun thing to look at. So anyway, that was just a general scotch in the news. Sean, let's get him caught up on the, the Reader's Digest version. We talked all Good. things Japanese. Okay. Done. So, how are you, man? I'm caught up. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. So, yeah, so we were talking $700 million. Um, in 2020, it was $67 million in Japanese whiskey. $67 million versus 700 million pounds right. of scotch. And scotch is how big of the whiskey market? In the United States, five to seven percent. Yeah, it's tiny. <laughs> Japanese whiskey is a very small percentage, but it's interesting what they're doing. They've got a, they've got an interesting history. 
then you can catch on. It's, it's huge money. Growing. Huge Growing. money. Yeah. yeah. And here we are being a part of it. It's and great. Here, yeah. And we're in Andrew's bar. You yeah. are. You were late to the show, but um, I'm glad you're man. here, man. I kind of like the change of pace. It is. It's different. You, We've got a, a couple I of like super chats. Do I off from, the bunker? I don't know how I feel about Drew being a timeout. <laughs> I don't know how Drew, Drew feels about being in town. <laughs> Hi, Drew. I, I keep putting you guys in large. I'm just sitting here watching. So I'm like, wow, you guys go ahead and keep going on this. I, I will say that there's a couple of countries on that list that were Latvia. That's that's well, how that's big like is that? Out of nowhere. What right? are they doing? That, that's like uh, <laughs> that's like putting five bucks on that pony that. There's no way they should win, and you know they, they place at least right. That's so, right, and you're eating good tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. It's like it's Mark so so huge in Latvia. Scotch for dummies is huge in Latvia, Drew. Well, I mean, and Spain <laughs> too. That that's an interesting market as well. I mean, they yeah. they do drink a lot of whiskey over there, but I wouldn't have. You know, I knew France was big, uh, right? But I did that's too. that's an interesting, and you know, like Singapore and some of those markets are huge. Just I mean, totally get that. Uh, but but they have the money to spend on. You know, we didn't think of a new mean, thing, Sean. What was that? We did think of a new, a new topic, Sean. Is as as we're going to do something for Andrew. It's where's the peat? Like where does it come from, and where do we distill it from? So not so much, you know, like whisk distillery, and where do they get the peat from? Can we make some kind of show out of that? So I think it might be an interesting topic if he can figure it out. All right. All right. Let's talk to Dr. Scotch and see if he can come up with something. Well, be one of the topics right before you walked in is there's another distillery opening up. And I yep. actually pointed out, I'm like, you know, Sean's been really trying to talk us into buying a mothball distillery for years. <laughs> and we missed another one. It's actually no, no, no. brand new from Scotch, right in the heart of Space Hide. Hey, man. Got the cash. I guess you can make it. You've got a couple hundred million just sitting around. <laughs> is that I'm all sure. it takes? <laughs> he yeah. knows because he's done the research. Yeah, yeah. yeah because it's you got to you got to let it run for four years before you well, sell anything. And, and a lot of this stuff, I mean, it's not just you know you build a. Uh, I mean, the stills and things like that are expensive, but yeah. you've got a lot of like environmental impact studies and where you get your water right. source from, and and what are right. you doing with you know your waste and you know. So I mean, there's a lot of like just. You know, logistics things to you know hurdles to clear and permits to get and things like that and it all costs money well that's so, all and right. it all takes time you know i mean it might be five to ten years from us oh. sitting around going you know we should open a distillery that sounds like a great idea take my hundred million dollars see what you can do you know and then you go out and and you know you've got to hire people and do all the you know you got to find the site and do all the things and, so. then, and then you got to let it run pay all those people pay the overhead right. pay the equipment for four years before you can sell us all, you know three of them. And, and then you turn around and have to do marketing, and so you know, it's crazy. Daniel uh, was posting more Pete. This is where I'm going next. I'm I'm right more behind you. I want to I want to pull of that. But you know, ten years later, you're eating ramen noodles, you know, dry out of a brick. <coughs> you can't afford to freaking boil the water. <laughs> I'm sure. Sure. You, you cough up a hundred million bucks. Who doesn't like dry ramen? And it got me through college. <laughs> Sprinkle the spice on it and just eat it like a cookie. <laughs> but, uh, I do like so guys, getting back on topic. So Japanese whiskey versus Scott. That's pretty good, interesting information. We did Irish net last week. So I think what else we got in store? Indian maybe down the road, and what well, else can we do? I think we got Indian. I we I definitely think Canadian has its own yeah. profile yeah. and its own story to tell. And then you know I think we're building up, Drew, without even knowing it intentionally. We're all building up to the American. I think we have to. Single malt, you know, bourbon, we single malt, whatever that, that may be. Wow, that's going to be an interesting one. I mean, two whiskeys in her, one whiskey leaves. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a big story because it's a huge market, especially where we live and what we have to do. And and who knows, maybe we have to pack up the van and go down south to Kentucky to, to tell that one. I don't know. Go on location, that. maybe. That'd be kind of cool. I go? Sure. You know how much I would like to tour MGP, that massive ethanol distillery. MGD? MGP. Oh, I was like, man, I, I haven't had some. some so, no, 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 so, so MGP, and I forget the name of the uh, yeah. multi <laughs> green products, whatever it is. Um, they distill a lot of ethanol for lots of, quite honestly, craft distilleries. Um, as they're starting to produce them, they build a distillery, they start distilling their own stuff, but they can't sell it for three years or a year or whatever. So they will buy barrels from MGP. Put the brand on it and sell it to make money to start the money flowing. 
but they their choices of grains and and different styles are extensive, and so you can really do a lot of essentially craft distilling at this massive ethanol plant in Indiana that we'd like to go. You just go to it. Tell them your mash bill, and they they build it for you, man. Well, so, they've got I mean, no I mean, it's, it's, I mean they, they say you want a twenty percent rye, you want forty percent rye, you want bourbons, do you want uh, single malts? Do you you know the, you they've got they've got a menu. What do you want, and how? What do you want it aged in, and what? And you know, they do all that. It's basically manufacturing on demand. It is, um, and I mean, you know, they they serve a very specific purpose. Yep. So God love them. And it is interesting, and it would be a lot they for be. us to learn. They be. So oh, before yeah. as, to close it out, one thing we didn't talk about this week, Drew, is this week's video oh, review, yeah. if you will. Oh, that's right. Um, it was kind of a. a one off an interesting thing it was a follow-up to one of our most popular videos right now um and it's getting a, our video uh johnny walker for dummies we've got three or four of those series out now glenn fiddick glenn ranji glenn livet glenn mccallan yeah so we might actually have more than walker. i think um maybe close to five maybe even half a dozen of these uh four dummy mm -hmm. series where our goal is to try to educate the subscribers, the, the viewers on a range of, of an especially story. new people new to scotch. Um, and it's it really truly is a beginner's guide. Look, I mean, you could spend hours diving into any one of these distilleries or or blenders sure. and getting I mean, let's be honest, man. How many years has Glenmo been around, right? Uh -huh. We we can't uh -huh. talk about every bottle they've ever put out. No. It's about getting through the, the the core range that you're gonna see on the shelf or you might you know, run across. Um, but as as much as we tried to do that with that Johnny Walker, uh, there were a couple missteps. <laughs> I forgot the swing bottle on me. So um, is that the only one in that video? You talking about swing? Well, almost. <laughs> but no, we you know we talked a little bit about about trying to. We actually answered some of the most popular questions wow. that, that, that was, I like that part. That was um, because people, you know, there are some really good comments, and when you see a hundred comments about the same topic. All right, it's time to at least answer it. So that's the first time we've ever done a follow-up, a part due of the series. Mm -hmm. But if the other ones follow suit, we would obviously want to do that. The question is, or what I want to put at everyone watching is, where do we go for the next four dummy series? I got to be honest, if I'm, if I'm telling you, I'm interested in doing the Highland Park one. I know it's going to be expensive because they're all over the freaking board and to get all those bottles. <laughs> <and houses. laughs> But and I want to put some sense to it because I love Highland Park. I just don't like that they're confusing the shit out of everyone, including me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't keep up with them. So what do you guys want to see as far as a four dummy series? I mean, you you guys spend a lot of time in your local uh, liquor stores and you see your shelves. And what's out there that maybe, you know, the novice scotch buyer needs to be educated on when they're looking at their bottles. Cause that's what we're, you know, we started six years ago to help people with their scotch purchases. And here we are. Inver yeah. house for dummies. Inver house. Plastic the candle for dummies. I was going to say that. <laughs> You're shooting that video, my friend. At least it'll, it will It only costs us 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, oh, man. you to turn it. The light so, I, with that, Drew, I, I, I think I've hit all our topics tonight, my friend. Malvini, yeah, I yeah, think that's, that's huge. Was yeah. He yeah, yeah, we probably need to do a Malvini. And that there's a, there's enough Malvinis to keep us busy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I like that suggestion. That actually, <clears throat> Highland Park and Malvini were the two that are in the back of my mind yeah. right now. Anyway, I think there's some interesting ones that aren't as popular that would be fun for us, like yeah. Bach Loman. Yeah, right? I think that'd be because awesome. they're doing different labelings, even different brands, right? You know, they're they're going down. I feel like that's a distillery that we could just show up at and hang out for like three days. It'd be a special, and and it would be a whole like okay, let's just walk through this whole thing. Show us again. We're just gonna pitch a tent in the back forty. We'll be back. Don't mind us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I that's pretty good too. All right, Drew. Like All right, guys. Cheers. We'll see you guys on the post show. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Cheers. Happy Thursday, guys. Thursday. Cheers, everybody. Love you.